my mother made it very much clear that we're going to end up somewhere. It's going to be great. We're going to, you know, learn the language. Like it's, there was just this sense that we're, we're waiting for some great thing to happen. And that changed everything. And it changed the way we waited. It changed the way we saw things. Do the stories we tell about ourselves have the power to change us? Our guest today says they can. Today, we share a conversation with Daniel Nayeri. He's the author of Everything Sad is Untrue, an award-winning young adult novel. In his book, Daniel tells an epic story, one with Persian myths, Oklahoman potlucks, death threats, candy bars, and school bullies. And this epic story is true, or mostly. Writing from the perspective of his 12-year-old self, Daniel Nayeri shares the story of how he, his sister, and his mother emigrated from Iran to Edmond, Oklahoma, after his mother's conversion from Islam to Christianity. Although this immigration kept his family out of prison, or worse, life in the U.S. came at a cost, too. Through his storytelling, Daniel also processes what he left behind. His beloved stuffed animal, Mr. Sheep Sheep, a life of comfort in Iran, and his larger-than-life father. To wrap up our season on meaning and purpose, we discuss the story with Daniel. We explore finding meaning through storytelling and the impact of an active imagination, and how the sustaining hope of the Christian story makes even a refugee camp in the Italian countryside a place of opportunity and joy. This is the Veritas Forum podcast, a place for generous dialogue about the ideas that shape our lives. This season, we're exploring meaning and purpose. I'm your host, Carly Regal, and I'm the podcast producer for the Veritas Forum. Getting into the content a bit, I'm curious, how did you come to write this book, like this particular book? You've written 10 books before this. You have one coming out now. How did you come to write this one? How did I come? Well, this is the <laughs> one I've been, I've been waiting to write forever. Uh, you know, this is the reason I became... A writer, I always sort of felt like my family story was uh, an obligation in some ways for me to write. And so going into school for creative writing and things like that, it was always kind of revolving around this. And as a result, it took a million different shapes. So during the, even during while I was writing those other 10 books, I always had the, the file for this book. And this was the big one. So so yeah, in a lot of ways, this was the book. And, it, and it, once it got off of my back, I was really, there was a gigantic sense of relief. Yeah. You've talked elsewhere about how even in that process that you transitioned the point of view of the book, because it is a memoir, but it's a memoir, not just spoken as a 12-year-old, but from the perspective of a 12-year-old. Can you tell me about that transition of how that came to be too? Sure. So yeah, initially I had written it from my perspective and I was a young man in my 20s and and I was functionally, I was an adult, right? So I would write these stories and something about them wasn't working. They were literary and they had this sort of sense of story structure, but emotionally they were pretty removed. And part of that is because as an adult, I I was not as emotionally fraught by, let's let's say the story of like, freeing Mr. Sheep Sheep. There's a passage in the book where, you know, the young boy has a stuffed animal. They have to free him into the wild, so to speak, before they can get on an airplane. And it's a, it's a really heart-wrenching scene for this young boy. When I was writing it as from my adult perspective, and I had it in the past tense, and I was speaking to an adult audience, presumably, there was a sense where I was telling you about how much anguish there was, but I wasn't helping you understand the anguish. I certainly wasn't feeling the anguish. And so it had this it had this sort of emotional remove that a lot of memoirs have and I didn't know what to do with it. I knew I didn't like it until I had a friend tell me, you know, you could just write it from the perspective you were when you experienced all this. And that unlocked everything. At that moment, I could certainly access that experience and deliver it with the same not just emotional pain but confusion. And so it made it actually made the the writing more accessible, less literary, more uh, certainly you know in the moment more and more confused, more jar, more sort of that whole there's a whole theme throughout the book of it being very patchwork and it, he's very ashamed of the fact that his memory 
isn't up to the task. And that all came as the book shifted over into the, you know, 12 year old perspective, because there's so much people don't even tell it. Like, you know, there's so much that a family hides from a little kid yeah, on purpose. And then the kid, you can usually intuit that there's something, there's something not making sense. And that sense of foreboding and dread is actually worse than if you'd told the kid in the first place. <laughs> that all was something that was born out of shifting the narrative. This book has been around for three years at this point. So I'm curious when people ask you, what's it about? And they haven't read it. What's the elevator pitch that you give to describe the book? Well, I, I say, you know, it's an autobiographical memoir piece of fiction that is about my family. Uh, you know, when we came to the United States, we were refugees from Iran. My mother had a fatwa on her head because she converted from Islam to Christianity. And so she kind of ran afoul of the secret police. And so we had to escape. My father chose to stay. So my mother, my sister, and I became refugees until we got asylum to the United States. And that's where the book opens. It sort of begins with a young man, myself, kind of standing in front of a classroom full of kids trying to explain what he did last summer. And the problem with that, of course, is... It's, well, we came to the United States, and the question you get from your classmates is, why? And it's like, well, because we were refugees. And so why? Well, because my mother had a fatwa on her head. And you can see very quickly that he's just having to explain more and more and more. And before you know it, he's all the way back four generations in his family until you're in this land of mythology and Persian legend. And the stories are getting bigger, and his classmates just simply don't believe him. They think he's a little refugee kid who's trying to puff himself up and make himself seem important. And so they have, you know, he's continuing, however, to tell the weave these, you know, larger and larger stories until at the climax, he finds out that his father, this man that he's been projecting as this hero of poetry and fairy tales is coming to Edmond, Oklahoma to visit his class. And so which will he be the the larger than life figure or, you know, some some schlub who's just visiting from Iran you know, and that that's where I usually leave it because the question will be undiscovered until you read it. Right. Yeah. I think one thing that really impressed me while reading the book was just the intricacy of the stories that you shared. I felt the sense of the incredible burden it is to try to explain your life to people who have no context whatsoever for what it's like to, you know, not be from Edmond, Oklahoma, where the story somewhat takes place. And I'm wondering, over these past three years that the book has been out, have there been specific stories that have stood out to readers in the many stories that you share? <laughs> well, I think one of the things that people point out, and I think I'm glad they do, is that in this genre, there's often kind of a bone to pick but very commonly in what I joke are sort of tales of immigrant woe, the bone to pick is like with the people who don't understand, right? And there's there's a lot of like old place good, new place bad dichotomies that frankly, I think are really shallow, right? It'll be stuff like, oh, you haven't had flavorful pad thai till you had the pad thai of my home country of Thailand. And you're like, oh, that's great. Um, that's probably true. But also that doesn't need to come at the expense of American cuisine. American cuisine in the last 30 years has been absolutely incredible. My book, of course, it opens that way, right? It opens with him kind of going, what is going on? Like, you, I can't get the kebabs of my home country. And and this food is is unfamiliar. What he's having to do, though, and what I like the sort of subversion of the genre slightly is that he is clearly not stopping there. He's clearly also realizing that there's no monopoly on knuckleheads and there's no monopoly on wonder and creativity. And so while I think it's fair for a book like this to open with old place good, new place bad, because fundamentally that's the last place his family was whole. It's the last place he had a dad. That's the last place he understood how to go to the bathroom. Like deeply unfamiliar culture shock is you know unpleasant and so that is that's how it starts i think i love it that people though have noted that it is um it's a book wherein he also starts to interrogate the other side of that argument right clearly if the play, old place was so good they wouldn't be trying to kill him and clearly if the new place was so closed it wouldn't be open to him the way it is it wouldn't be such a great refuge with so many so many wonderful people at first he's tempted to do this he wants to like believe in the magic of the place that 
he came from because, well, the place he's at is very challenging right now. It's not because it's Edmund. It's because it's an abusive home. It's They're poor. All those things. He starts to actually not only interrogate that, but to combine that. And, and the world of storytelling is no longer locked to a location or one culture. And that near the end, as he starts to pick up on it, it starts to weave together. And the, this patchwork all starts to make a f- picture. And I like that they f- sort of picked up on that. that it's not like, oh, look, you know, here's another dude who's dogging on the United States or the vice versa. Here's another dude who's like so happy to be out of Iran. I don't feel that way at all about either. In terms of specific stories, of course, the poop stories come up a lot because <laughs> there's a lot of the comedy of that kind of comes up. A lot of food, of course, I'm obsessed with food. So I think the two biggest categories are food and poop, which makes sense. Yeah. As a reminder, he's a, telling the story from a 12-year-old perspective. That's why poop <laughs> yes. is a relevant point of story. I think it's very relevant. <laughs> Tom Rushdie has some really great, if you want like a smarter than Daniel, more literarily pedigreed author to talk about poop for you. Midnight's Children, the Booker of Winner, I think has a really interesting metaphor throughout of like, well, his his metaphor begins with pickling. And of course, pickling is a major part of the cuisine there, but also this notion of a person pickling in their own depravity at times, in their own juices, and their own habits. This is a visualization of many of the characters. And um, and there's a moment, I won't go into it because it's just another, you know, story about poop where the main character, Salim Sinai, is looking out and he sees and he sees just this old, I guess I'm telling it. Why did I tell you I'm not going to tell you? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> He he's looking out. He's sort of feeling this malaise of not knowing what to do with his life. And he looks out and he sees this homeless man through this window who is squatting and defecating right there out in the street. And he's sort of this like cackling, toothless old homeless man who looks at it, looks at him, catches Salim's eye and goes, I used to make them this big. And he's like, <laughs> as if as if it's like a fish story. Like, oh, I just, my poops used to be huge. And there's something really fascinating about that. It's it's sort of it's grotesque. It's it's crude, but it's an older man sort of laughing at the, and being vivacious, like laughing at the loss of vivaciousness. Like literally saying, "I used to be a man of great pooping potential." And so it actually is an important moment if you were writing your doctoral thesis on Midnight's Children and like. Ulysses, you'd be talking about the poop scene at least a little bit. In this book, he's thinking similarly about these things. What he's saying is, I keep noticing the adults in my life. Some of them have been greatly hurt. And some of them just pass that on. Like they they eat food and then poop food. Like they are animals as in the way that animals do nothing but bring stuff in and take stuff out. So then what is this noble calling of someone, in this case, like his mother, who are able to metabolize all of this pain and turn it into something artful or turn it into something caring? There is some some machinery happening inside that is not the simple work of a, of an intestine. And as a result, he's curious. Poop is actually playing a symbolic sort of role to the, the food. And how he perceives, you know, one's status is based on the best food that one gets. And he's also noting that one's status might be based on what is the nature of your output? How are you then, you know, taking in the input of life and outputting something else? It's a crude metaphor. It's a 12-year-old's metaphor. Mm-hmm. But it's <laughs> but it wasn't like just, I think sometimes people do ask, they're like, did you put it in there for the kiddies? And I'm like, no, I think I think poop is like pickling, a very important visualization of your internal uh, landscape. That was my thesis on on poop. <laughs> <laughs> I've come up with a pun and I'm going to go with it. But honestly, when I was reading your book, some of the stories were hard to digest. Uh, <laughs> uh, pause for laughter there. Love it. <laughs> but I think something that really stood out to me with the perspective of a 12 year old, you know, it's very much visceral. It's very much nuanced. There are times where, you know, there was blood, gore, like poop, things where I was like, man, I've really got to read through this and be able to actually absorb this well and digest this well. But it was challenging. And also like, something about having the perspective of a 12 year old means that, you know, these things are happening and they're not tied up in a bow. The stories are there. 
And that's just the experience. So I was just wondering, since you were writing this book later on in life, was there parts of your story that you were tempted to leave out? Yeah, very much so. I, you know, in my head as a as a creator, I sort of labeled those the leaks. There are parts I did not want to tell, and there are parts that a 12-year-old version of me would not have wanted to tell, and he leaks them by accident. Mm -hmm. And that happens, I think, all the time to kids who sort of experience anything like that. You're kind of shot if you work with kids like that or you've been around them. One of the things you'll be note is sometimes they'll say the most horrific things in the most cavalier way. Like they don't even recognize yet that that was like an explosion in their emotional life. And then sometimes they'll think of actually very, you know, minor elements and minor details as having had the most import and they hold on to that. They've got a very subjective experience to that. And knowing that helps sort of makes the narrator a little bit more authentic that he, he has certain things that he like, his candy bars being stolen by his sister is more of a betrayal that in some ways than his father not coming with them. Like he's able to tell you about his father coming, but he cannot tell you about this, like how badly that hurt. And so in some ways I had to acknowledge that a 12 year old me wouldn't be as polished at hiding those things. As like a writer, you always have a particular like craft indulgence that you're, you're up to. In this case, it was, can I write a novel from a, the perspective of a narrator or a storyteller who's actually bad at storytelling? He's not good. Like he's he has not gone to writing school. He's not very good at speaking English. As we said, he's emotionally leaking half the information anyway. He doesn't know what order of operations he should deliver the information. So often he's like needs to stop, go back and tell you an important detail to make things make sense. He repeats himself. He pauses, he's discursive, he's distracted. He's almost every quality of a bad storyteller. You know, if you have one in your friend group and you're at dinner and they start a story and you're like, for goodness sake, this story has one beat. Could you just tell it to us? Like, we don't need these facts. That he's he's like this. So a lot of the challenge for me personally, and I love doing projects that are properly difficult, the challenge with this one was what if he's not good? Like, what if he can't tie up the loose ends? What if he has zero clue how to make meaningful sense? Even of the poop metaphor, it's like, he's dealing with it, but there's no point in the book do you get the stuff I was telling you about in terms of the metaphor of inputs and outputs as much as, you know, any of us could interpret when we look at it as adults. And that was something I had to, I had to sort of just go with. That's what was most important to me. So uh, yeah, so he embarrassed me a lot. <laughs> 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 but yet, what's interesting is we didn't ask about the title on purpose because we wanted to ask it at this point. He has this really profound sense that everything sad is untrue. I'm curious, why the title? He's 12. Why this title? <laughs> well, I think part of it is this this like naive ability to reject reality in some ways. I mean, the, there's the reason I chose the title was sort of twofold. One was the the this kind of primal yop against, you know, primal anger against the sadness of reality. Like he doesn't, he, he has a child's surprise at injustice that is truly uncynical. <laughs> like he's, he's just like, he just continues to be surprised by people. And so, you know, the, the direct reference of that line is from the Lord of the Rings. It's from this moment where Sam wise is, you know, who's the heart of the story. Who's like the most naive guy ever. Um, looks at Gandalf, who, you know, spoiler alert for Lord of the Rings, has <laughs> returned. And he says, will everything sad become untrue? And it's just such a delightfully childlike question that this one thing has reversed itself, so all bad things are going to reverse themselves. Sounds good to me. So for a long time, the title was Everything Sad Will Become Untrue. And as I lived with that, I just thought, you know, this narrator is not Samwise. Like, he's actually kind of more grasping than Samwise. He's more rash. He's more, in some ways, he's more of a... What's the word? I think grasping is the right word in the sense that for him, if it's going to happen in the future, then it might as well have happened now, which is another fallacy of his thinking. So he just sort of goes ahead and like, you know, as they say, like he just names and claims the future. And it, as a result is a sentence that's inaccurate, right? When you put it in the present tense, there's no hope of that sentence being true. Specifically, there are many sad things and they're happening and they're very real. So the second reason I chose that title was because of its inaccuracy. I wanted the reader to kind of 
uh, you know, any astute reader is going to read that sentence and be like, uh, what is this? Like, is this is sentimentalist? Is this model? Like, what kind of goofy writer makes a sentence like that? And the answer is a 12 year old one who's terrified you think he's goofy. So when you open the pages, that skepticism you've already hopefully been, you know, prompted toward is what he's reacting to on page one. He says, all Persians are liars and lying is a sin. And he says, that's what everybody else thinks of me. And in that instance, I really wanted the reader to be one of those people. Everybody thinks this kid's a what who is this? What is this? There's there should be that doubtful approach to this book because he's then spending the rest of the book trying to alleviate your the doubt that he perceives in you. So it kind of functioned on two levels and I, I really liked it as a result. Yeah, I loved it. I think something that's really inspiring about the Daniel main character in your book is the imagination that he possesses. Because ultimately, in order to make that bold claim that everything sad is untrue, you have to have an imagination for a world where that is the case. And our podcast season, this season is on meaning and purpose. And this is our last episode for the season. And we season wanted- Season finale, y'all. Yeah, exactly. get excited. <laughs> and ultimately, we want to have our listeners hear- you talk about imagination because we see imagination as a real powerful tool in making meaning of our lives. And something that struck us while reading through your book is we feel like your mom as the hero of the story is sort of the the role model for you and how to be imaginative, how to say everything sad is untrue without a sense of sarcasm or incredulity about it. So we'd like to ask you to tell two different stories about your mom. And the first story is one of my favorite stories from the book, but it's you and your mom and your sister, and you're in the immigrant camp in Italy. And your mom really wants you and your sister to continue your ed education. Could you tell us and the listeners more about that story? Sure. I can tell it to you from memory because I forget that chapter. But um. By the time we get to Italy, the school seasons are coming to an end, and I've at this point sort of missed a whole year of school, and we're hoping that we've come to the tail end of our search in the sense that we think it's going to be an English-language-speaking country that we end up in, so Canada, UK, Australia, or the United States. So as a result, my mom, you know, just the character development that I perceived in her as a young man was like, she immediately took that information. And that information was not certain. It was just a high probability. And she goes, we can, we can like prepare for this. And so English is the language that we were going to learn. And so she started looking immediately for how to do that. She located a, a family that had kids our age. They were an American family who were living abroad and they were homeschooling their kids. The daughter was my sister's age and the, the boy was my age. And so they were in the same court classes and, and the classes were booklets. If I remember correctly, there were 11 books per subject and there were six subjects. So 66 books that you had to go through over the course of the whole year. There's two months at the end of the year and the kids had gone through the majority of the books and they were trash at this point. They were just workbooks that had been written in. And so my mother asked them if we could come to the house and you know learn on those books. And so I remember we went to this uh, stationery store and my mom bought an eraser that looked like one of these novelty erasers you get at gift shops. Like it was like a football size eraser <laughs> and, you know, some pencils. And we got on this bus in Mentana outside of Rome, through Rome to this, these people's houses. And so what happened then is we sat in this room and my mom would take these workbooks and she would sit next to us and she would just erase for hours all day just erase. And if you've ever worked on like a cheap paper of a workbook, you know that like there's an indentation that happens yeah. with your pencil. <laughs> you don't just erase it on the first stroke. <laughs> but this, she's just going over these pages trying to figure out how to like make the workbooks new again. And I, she would send them down the line and my, my sister and I would sit there. And so in weeks, we managed to go through our grades and catch up to the, to the kids. And and it, ta it taught me so much. Like one of the things it taught me was just the sheer determination of like quite literally taking trash, refurbishing it, and delivering it to us as, you know, exactly what we needed. 
The other is, of course, just the the, the grit of like she had calluses on her hands for the rest of her life because of, I mean it's hours of I know that sounds like a minuscule task, but do it for a few hours and it'll start hurting. And I remember thinking, you know, head down, determined, completely unwilling to acknowledge the insurmountable nature of the task and that she really kind of like carried us down this path of this is what happens when you're unstoppable and i went okay that was a strong lesson yeah that word unstoppable was definitely something it's clearly a theme about your mom throughout the story obviously you tell that story and there's so many other stories about your mom's unstoppability one of the things that stood out to me when i was reading was She's even unstoppable when the risk might even be her life, when it came to her converting. You talk about how she's a Sayed, so a descendant from both sides from Muhammad. So for her becoming a Christian, it's not just that she's unstoppable with a hard drive. She's uh, unstoppable even when the risk is super, super high. And you share the story of your sister becoming a Christian, and then at a couple pages later, it says, and my mom shortly thereafter became one. I didn't necessarily get a grasp of that story of your mom becoming a Christian. I don't know if you can share that. Sure. I mean, yeah, my mom will sort of say it this way. She talks a lot about faith, obviously. <laughs> this has clearly been the sort of central chapters of her life. So one of the ways she talks about how for her conversion happened was she says, you know, previous to becoming a Christian, she was a, like a Quranic scholar. Like she read this stuff deeply. She was very devout. She was not someone who just kind of, I don't know, swam in those waters. She absolutely had consciously and purposefully looked at all that stuff. And, and that for her was really important because it laid the foundation for her to be able to read the Bible and not just go, oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, it says nice stuff. That's great. You know, there's no, there's no like controversy to it. There's no exclusivity to these ideas. There's no scandal. And in fact, when she read it, she's like, oh no, it was scandalous. It was exclusive. It was controversial. Like it was saying things that contradicted what I believed up until now. And that contradiction demands a decision. Hmm. And and so for her, it was quite literally just coming into contact with the gospel and with reading it and and very quickly deciding this is, I see it. This is this is the truth. As we see in the book, she commits sort of whole hog. So she converted in the UK while we were there as a result of that, uh, what what I sort of just described as that an encounter with the salient facts of what the gospel is sort of saying. Again, like if you just hand somebody a gospel and say like, read it and it'll blow your mind. I think sometimes the disappointing thing for people is they'll read it and be like, yeah, cool. I saw, you know, there's, there isn't even, there isn't that sort of necessarily the insight into saying, hey, this is one of the other scenario. This is something like there's claims being made here that like, you know, by that, I mean, like, you know, if you the sort of the old the adage that we might both be familiar with, of like, people will say this about the figure of Jesus as a historical figure, like, he was making claims that, you know, either lunatics make, or he was clearly sincere in his claims. So you kind of have to go with lunatic or king. Kind of, or what's interesting is liar, right? That's the other option. Yeah, lunatic liar king, right? Yeah. Which is a theme in your book. It starts off with you know all Persians are liars, yeah. And even you said the title has a little bit of a lie to it, and it's just interesting when you when you talk about well, is it is it okay just to have a belief if it makes your life better, even if it's not true, just to live it as if it's better? But you say your mom comes down on the, no, it is the truth of Christianity was the thing that made her switch. It wasn't like, oh, my life would be better. I can I can live this way. Actually, my life wouldn't be better, <laughs> you know? Yeah, for her, in a lot of ways, it was worse, right? In a lot of ways, it was better too. I, you know, but in a whole lot of ways, it was not. It was not, I think a lot of people would, be, if the perception of the Middle East is like, Nothing but this, you know, like helicopter footage of sepia toned, burned out buildings. Then it's like, oh, well, who wouldn't want to come to the, you know, to the West? And and it's not untrue. I think the West is awesome. So I love it. But it's also untrue to act like she was just dying to get out of a war zone. She had a good life. And I think the good nature of her life, you know, is part of the the challenge of her sort of testimony in that sense. Sometimes people will be like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, refugees will say anything. 
in order to get to a better place. And that, you know, that certainly is something that happens. I just don't think it was what happened with my mom. The other aspect about like you changing the title, everything sad will be untrue versus everything sad is untrue. It's really interesting. We don't tend to use these types of words on this podcast, but I always think of the eschatological reality. Basically, by that, I mean, what do I think the future has in life? You talk at the end about how what we believe about the reality of the future can impact our day-to-day lives today. So that meaning and purpose theme that we have for the podcast, it's like, well, like let's not pretend like what we believe about the future doesn't matter to what happens today. You give a little comparison about in the different ways that what you believed about the future impacted your time at the refugee camp. Sure, yeah. So one of the interesting, I mean, refugee camps are really fascinating case studies in, in character, right? Yeah. The one that we were at was in the late 80s. We were in Italy. And so there were a lot of Eastern European. I mean, this is the fall of the sort of Soviet bloc is happening at this time. And the Roma people were, you know, frankly, like walking across the mountains in some cases. And so, so you had a lot of different people groups, a lot of different languages. It was all kind of colliding. A lot of them were older people who in some ways like felt they had no future wherever they ended up was not going to be the place that they had spent 60 years of their lives like there was a hopelessness that was palpable when you would be out in the courtyard there was just a lot of like sudden weeping there was a lot of you know these sort of older people sitting together when i say courtyard i mean like just like imagine just parking lot cement parking lot you know some of them are sitting on cinder blocks there's chairs but it's like It's not like they're sitting in a tree-lined portico. And they would just sit out there. And they were waiting, of course, for their paperwork to come in. They were waiting for some younger person in their family to maybe come to them or to do that kind of paperwork. There was all this waiting. And and so, you know, the nature of waiting, as we know, is a forward-focused behavior. You're waiting for something to happen. And that really drove home for me this dynamic you're describing, because what those people were waiting for was absolutely determinant to how they behaved. Some of these older people, frankly, like there was no chance that what they were waiting for was going to be what they had lost. They had a sense that they were going to end up somewhere, but it was going to be diminished in every way. It was going to be where they ended up dying. There was a lot of tragedy that they were processing. And so they had just no motivation to do anything. There was a peach orchard like across the hillside. And my mom and I and my sister, we would walk down there all the time. It was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. You would walk down the staircase down a hillside. It's it's the Italian countryside, for goodness sakes. It's gorgeous. (laughs) And we would have these hikes. My mother made it very much clear that we're going to end up somewhere. It's going to be great. We're going to, you know learn the language like it's there was just this sense that we're we're waiting for some great thing to happen and that changed everything as a result i was like well some great thing's gonna happen so this time is free time cool let's go run around and play soccer and for me there was an adventurous spirit to it i i obviously also knew we were in quite a bit of trouble and things like that but as a kid in the everyday she had really put that program out there which was something good's coming And it changed the way we waited. It changed the way we saw things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's been a few decades since those days in the Italian countryside. In some ways, what you were waiting for has been realized. But in other ways, what you've been waiting for has not been realized. And I was just wondering, how has your story unfolded in the past few decades? Has everything sad really been untrue? (laughs) You know, I think I think as a young man, he is a bit brash in the sense that it is probably, a, to be perfectly accurate, it's a future tense. And let's help him not to confuse those things. But yeah, I mean, the short answer to your question is, I mean, why I cry at the 4th of July is because, uh, you know, here in America, you can come as a refugee and in one generation, one generation, like it should be my grandkids who are living my life right now. But getting to getting to write, getting to be a publisher in the publishing industry, getting to do all the things I've gotten to, just lucky enough to be be a chef. You know, I own a motorcycle now. Motorcycles aren't that expensive, <laughs> but I but I always <laughs> dreamed of owning one. And I own one, you know? And how, like my uncle used to own one in Iran. And that, I thought that was the greatest achievement you could have. And so those are the, you know, childish things. I met my wife here. Uh, we had our son here. Once you meet 
the love of your life and you have a son, the valence to everything that led you there has to be good. You can never regret anything. And that's the beauty and loveliness of it all. So in that sense, yeah, everything said was totally untrue. You know, in another sense, it would be callous and and disingenuous to pretend I wouldn't like to see my father again. I wouldn't like to see my grandmother again. You know, my grandfather died, who's in this book. And, you know, that really is what instigated the writing of this. When he passed was when I really, you know, day in, day out started getting it down on paper because fundamentally like the clock had run out. Like I will never, I wouldn't get to go back and see him. Um, Of course, I hope that someday I get to go back and see my grandmother, hopefully in time, right? And see the rest of my family. Those are things I, I hold in one hand. In the same time, on the other, I hold how lucky I am and how ultimately, you know, positive the, the experience was. In that sense, you have to go across a long enough timeline. I also don't doubt that across a long enough timeline, all these sadnesses will be, you know, healed and made up for. In the Brothers Karamazov, the epigraph of that book, right, it is the big statement that explicates the entirety of that idea where he says i believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for right and so yeah we're still in the middle of the story okay speaking of stories you have a new book that just came out in march called the many assassinations of samir the seller of dreams what is it about Yeah, so this one is very much where a character very akin to my father kind of takes center stage this time. You know, the first one is, you know, my mom gets center stage. This time it's a it's kind of an adventure comedy set on the Silk Road where there is this merchant named Samir, the seller of dreams. And he is a huckster and a con man and he's going village to village swindling people. But at the outset of the story, this young man who's the narrator is about to be stoned to death. And the the merchant comes sashaying into the crowd, hustles everybody, saves the young man and purchases him into his, you know, servitude. And so what you get is the testimony of this boy. His name is Monkey, who is telling you about his his master, Samir, who was such a terrible huckster and con artist that he had seven different assassins sent to kill him by each of those <laughs> villages who were quite upset from, from his behavior. And he tells you right up front that even though he, the monkey, was the one who um, helped save his master, ultimately he was also the one who had to kill him. And so what sort of ensues is is monkey's testimony to the authorities of how his master's passing came to be and so it's called the many assassinations of samir the seller of dreams oh that sounds good incredible nice. yeah. <laughs> so for listeners whose interest is peaked we're going to have links in the podcast description to both everything sad is untrue and the many assassinations of samir the seller of dreams which is a mouthful but <laughs> i got it off in one one breath Thank you. Yeah, long (laughs) titles are my favorite. Yeah. So thinking about storytelling, thinking about imagination from our conversation today, I just think those skills are so crucial to a well-lived life. And here at Veritas, we think imagining, hoping for a world where everything sad is untrue is such a critical part of the life of the university, something that we want to see in the university. Um, So for listeners who want to be better at storytelling, want to cultivate this type of imagination, what sort of resources or tips or practices would you have for them? Well, I think imagination is a muscle, first of all. So, and I mean that quite literally, like, like repetition of imagining makes you better at imagining. So, and I think a lot of people don't give themselves enough time to wander. I'll give you very practical things to do. The first is sort of, I, I use my alpha theta borderline moments practically. And by that, I mean, when you're about to fall asleep or as you're coming out of sleep, there is this period of time, what we call the alpha theta borderline, where your mind is not yet in its unconscious and not yet in its conscious state, right? You're waking up, you're kind of aware that you're waking up, but you could be, if you wanted, like flying around. And some people call it like lucid dreaming is kind of somewhat in this space. But it's really just every morning as you're getting up, if you just lay there, you'd be shocked at the prompts you could give yourself. I spend a lot of time imagining. And as a result, I spend a lot of time imagining my stories in that period of time. Your mind is making connections you would never make otherwise. And I would do that 
The second thing is I think people underestimate the power of boredom because we don't ever have to be bored anymore. We conquered it with our smartphones. I highly recommend throwing your smartphone into a lake. <laughs> but but specifically, if you don't want to do that, just keep bringing it in your pocket until you can't stand it. And letting your mind wander, it's wonderful to do. And it's part of the you know machinery, quite literally part of the, the muscle building of imagining. The last is, of course, I think realizing that even if you're not doing any of those things, you are a storytelling animal. Trying to step outside in sort of a meta sense of your own experience and asking yourself, what are the type of stories you tell the most? Let me give you some examples of stories, because it's not just how many times do you stand and deliver in front of your friends at an open mic night. It's also how many brunches do you go to and gossip about other people? How many times do you describe something that happened to you while complaining about it at the airport? How many times <laughs> do you like all of these things are functionally stories. And I, one of the things I try to tell young people, especially is you are subject. And let me be clear, you are subject. That means you are ruled by the stories you tell, and you are most ruled by the stories you tell about yourself, to yourself. You are the person who is telling yourself who you are. You are building that narrative as any propagandist does. And I would ask you not to tell the mean ones. <laughs> ask yourself, what are these stories? Would you ever listen to the stories that you tell about yourself told about your best friend? Like, would you ever actually allow anyone to speak that way to you? I. I think it's fascinating to go through that process, especially like there's a lot of like, I don't know, you can just sit down and as an exercise, like just write down the times where like, how does Daniel describe Daniel? It's not nice. It's not, it's not a gracious thing. Not I'm like, you know, it's not a gracious narrator who's talking. So to that extent, I think storytelling is just the way we are going to communicate that that is sort of unavoidable. Becoming aware of them is very, very possible and getting better at being imaginative to maybe tell a different story about yourself. Maybe, maybe sort of see yourself from a different perspective. Those are, those are my best bets. Those are awesome. Love that. Thank you so much. Really appreciated our conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Thanks for listening to this season on meaning and purpose. This was our final episode of the season. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be sharing monthly episodes over the summer, so be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast so you don't miss an episode. If you have feedback on our season or ideas for what we can share next, send us an email at podcast at veritas.org. We love hearing from you. Our production is led by me, Carly Regal, and the team at Resonate Recordings. Thanks to Bethany Jenkins and Seth Bollinger for providing content editing and audio support for this episode, and to Heather Beloga for coordinating all of our production needs. Thanks also to our guest for today, Daniel Nayeri. You can find links to Everything Sad is Untrue and Daniel's newest book, The Mini Assassinations of Samir, the Seller of Dreams, in the podcast description. Thanks also to our incredible partners who help support Veritas and make sure these conversations are possible. And a final thanks goes to you, the listener. Thanks for listening as we explore the ideas that shape our lives. 